Hi, my name's Lindsay Ross. I'm a teacher librarian in the middle school, Central Middle School in Victoria, BC, and I'm here with colleagues from public and private schools in Victoria and here in Vancouver. And first of all, I just want to say how much I appreciate being here in this kind of event that brings together all kinds of libraries. Um, but I wondered if you could comment further about um, how you see the kind of collaboration that can happen in the future now and in the future between uh, the various libraries, school libraries and public libraries and university libraries. I know that all of us, the people that I'm here with tonight, we collaborate as extensively as we possibly can and very much appreciate those relationships. But um, right now we're talking about learning commons in schools, school libraries, and I'd just be very interested to hear what your thoughts are on collaboration and maybe on learning commons. Thank you. On learning commons? Well, you, you, you've heard much of my thoughts on learning commons, and I'm a big believer in blended learning, too. So, you know, that part of it is, is within the education. I, I guess the one thing I'd have to say is, is that um, a, a, I really do believe there's only one user, you know, and that it needs to be a seamless type of a system. We know that in university libraries, for example, that it, when freshmen come into university, that there's a great deal of time and attention is spent on BI, bibliographic instruction. And that time is spent on BI because they don't necessarily, students coming into it know how to search for information or find the information components of it. Well, you know, I, what if they didn't go to university? What if they go out into the, the, the world without having gone to university or college or missed a class on BI? Really, because I, I guess university, let me see, back up for just a second. There was a report that was done last December, so December 2011 on academic libraries in the United States, chaired by Roy Tennant in California. And uh, one of the conclusions from that report is that academic libraries have already reached the tipping point where books are no longer of primary importance. And what they were actually saying is, is that you can go all the way through many universities almost without touching a book you know, in order to receive very good research materials from them. What we're seeing in the States is some libraries that, and that's a slight overstatement, but that's where they're saying it's, it's heading in that area. We're seeing some libraries in the States that are taking the book material and locking it up the way it almost was in the 50s and 60s because it's expensive to provide the security for that particular material. And if they lock it up in a less expensive manner, they can staff the library and make it open 24 hours a day. And then they can acquire the material by a request where they will go and get it and bring it to the student who wants it. But all of the other material and the collaboration spaces and the staff that can assist with that are in the public spaces in the public areas. That's a huge change. You know. What are we doing, if that's the way they're doing it in university, what are we doing in K-12 to to make sure that students are ready for that? And what are we doing in the public to make sure that when they graduate from university, because I've heard from so many, in fact, I just heard again yesterday from a university grad who said that their biggest disappointment was they had access to all of the professional journals that related to their professional degree when they were at university. And then when they graduated, they lost access to that particular material. So what do we do in order to create a seamless society where, in fact, professionals continue to grow after they go out of university? where a person that goes into university is prepared for those types of searches and finding information in that way. And if they don't go to university and go into the, you know, the broad world, and if that's the way the information is actually going to be presented, not just information, but that creative material as well, that they're not afraid of access and that they know how to access it. So to me, one of the ways in which we do that is, as I say, Technology doesn't recognize boundaries. It doesn't recognize physical boundaries and it doesn't recognize boundaries between types of services. And that it is actually much cheaper to negotiate licenses together. It's much cheaper to work at a lot of those licenses and it means that when you learn how to use certain material in school, that when you graduate into the world or you graduate and go to post-secondary, that those skills travel with you and you then can access that in order to find the material you need for life. Now, many people have heard me tell this story, you know, and, and I will, I'll tell it again. <coughs> I have, my son, his birthday is tomorrow, he's 21 years old, Caleb, and he's in third year. Oops, I said his name and I'm on television, it's okay, Caleb, he doesn't mind, he knows I tell this story. Um, Caleb is 21 years old tomorrow, 
He has a condition called multiple endocrine neoplasia type 2B, which is short form for it. It's MENQB. It's a uh, spontaneous genetic condition. Until Caleb, every Canadian who had MEN2B as a spontaneous condition died in their teens from an incredibly painful form of thyroid cancer. Caleb didn't. And Caleb didn't, I, and when they said, the doctors, he was four years old, the doctor said, your son has multiple endocrine neoplasia. And then the, doc, then the doctor said to me, because he knew I was a librarian, he said, don't look it up. Oh, yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> don't look it up. Yeah. So I went and raced back to the library. <laughs> and I asked, I looked at all of the, the latest reference books on genetic conditions. And every one of them said, my son's going to die. You know. And at that time, it was Medline. So I had to sign on to it separately, go on to the separate logins and find that information. And there was uh, research that was unpublished yet, but it was still in the early stages. And one of the doctors for it was from Queen's University. And there was a new type of, of marker where they said, if he is in this state, then we can do this operation and there's every chance that we will be able to save their life. And we've done it with eight people in the world so far. Well, the doctor found the same research. The blood sample had to be fresh within uh, two hours of having been taken. It was helicoptered to Kingston, tested, came back problem uh, positive. They did the operation, they saved his life. And in terms of the cancer, he was cured. So the books said my son was going to die. The latest electronic information showed us the way in which his life was saved. So I sometimes talk about this in several contexts. One of them is which was friendlier, you know, the book or the latest information that saved his life. But the other context, I think, is, is accurate information. When I look at my son's condition and other types of conditions, on the internet, as great as Google is, and as great as the internet is, I'm appalled because the actual medical information that is available to people is absolutely dismal. And I think that there are certain select areas, and I mentioned this inside the report as well, where we've given up on the nonfiction side of things, and yet we need to go back into that business because the first page results based upon people who are willing to pay more money or based upon searches that are dealing with donations or whatever it may be are not the best results that are going to produce the best medical solution for people. So I think there's certain areas that we've given up on as well. And, and sorry, I'm veering off of your topic, but you know, I wanted to go to that one too. Yeah. Yeah. I go back to the creation components of it, and not just from the things of maker spaces and collaboration spaces in those areas, but there was a report that was done in uh, the 1970s in Regina and then was repeated in 2005 at Regina, Kitchener, Hamilton. Halifax and Vancouver, I think, um, where what they did is measured uh, where people found information and where people found books. And one thing they discovered in both the, uh, the 70s report and the one that was done in 2005 was that young kids were taken to the library by their parents. But as soon as they reached a certain age, then if there wasn't a library that was available and a public library that was available for them to go to, then that joy of reading and the use of reading began to, to decline. And, and what the 1970s study showed is that you needed school libraries because if the parent wasn't going to take them to a public library and there aren't enough of them for people to walk to or ride a bike to for all of those uh, uh, areas, then they needed a school library in order to find fiction and in order to find creative material. And I sometimes think that we make the mistake of thinking of the school library as the place that is only there for information support. It's there in order for people to learn the joy of reading as well.
Is there more wine at the reception? <laughs> <laughs> okay. And I'm looking down because I can see you better on the screen than I can by looking at you. So. Hello, can it's Sybil. Oh, um, hi, Sybil. In case you can't see me. First of all, I wanted to um, just comment that, um, about quite a remarkable British Columbia consortium called EHLBC. And it's a consortium of the academic community and um, the regional health authorities and the Ministry of Health, where it is from um, study to practice. So students are exposed to um, resources in healthcare and when they get into the field, and there's a number of associate members, the physiotherapists and the um, um, audiologists, a whole number of allied health fields. So I think it's just a really quite remarkable um, um, initiative in British Columbia. And I also just, I wanted to pick up from what the teacher librarian said, you know, I work at Camosun College and much of my work is about collaboration beyond the library. And it takes up all my energy and all my time. And there's all very few of us, and I, I was just sort of thinking, I heard somebody from Victoria, and oh gosh, I would just love to have the time to get out there and connect with the schools, but it's that challenge in this time when we're so, um, like in, a, in our setting, it's so important to do the collaboration within, and it's not a lot of energy to do it <laughs> beyond. So I, I have many thoughts on that. I, I, you know, I, and to me, to, to even go back to the school component of it, and you get it, I find it unfortunate that the quality of the school library is oftentimes determined individually, school by school, by whether or not the principal is determined, you know, or is, is supportive of it, which is, it is most unfortunate that we need to make sure that there are standards that are existent that are common across it in order to make sure, because they're an important component of people being prepared for the, for the world. But I think it's great the health initiative. And Vancouver Public Library did one with Health Canada in the U.S. as well. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you very much for your comments. Uh, I'm Paul Tutch of the BCLTA. And uh, I really enjoyed listening to what you had to say about the future and how we're changing and adjusting. Uh, one area that I'd like to ask you about We've talked about librarian backgrounds and, and uh, user backgrounds. Um, what about, do we need to adjust the core comp competencies of our trustee boards <laughs> uh, to, to consider the future better? Uh, do we need to look beyond the, the standard lawyer, accountant, uh, architect, et cetera? I think that's two bottles of wine myself. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I, I can tell you my truism that's statement, which is, is that uh, where good library boards work in sync with the city and get along, it's the best structure in the world. Absolutely superb. And when you have a dysfunctional nature where they don't get along with the city and they're dysfunctional with themselves, it's the worst structure possible. <laughs> so, you know, we have to make sure that we build and grow those uh, good library boards, and it's, it's a tough thing to do. Um, I don't know if there is any um, ideal, I, I mean, it, the makeup of boards differs from province to province and state to state. And I've seen lots of different types of initiatives to build, you know, a better board, smaller numbers, representative of different areas. I don't think I've seen one structure that works better than the other. And it comes down to the relationships and comes down to the municipality and the board and the senior staff in the library and an element of trust. And when there's trust and respect, and when there is a, a clear identification of roles and everybody understands their responsibilities, when the board is not dealing operationally but is dealing in terms of policy, works great. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I don't think it makes any difference who those people are. It's the trust component of it that's most important. 